Well, we certainly appreciate everybody sticking around. This is part two of the interview with uh, Mr. Jeff Nielsen, India's gold scheme and silver depletion. And we're going to pick up right where we left off in part one. Thank you so much. Really big, the big money is coming in, and that's what is driving the retail market at this point. Would you, what do you think about that? Uh, I, I certainly believe that, you know, the big buyers, and of course by that we generally mean Russia and China, are the most important players in the market at the present time. And of course, you know, that gets into a whole other subject we've talked to at length with respect to, quote unquote, the gold war and China suddenly leaping into uh, the open market and beginning to purchase gold on the open market every month when it had exactly. not been doing that for many years. So, yeah, there, there's, there's no doubt that it's already happening in gold. But, you know, the silver market is so much murkier in a lot of respects. And a lot, a lot of it has to do with the fact that uh, there are, that, you know, silver is not officially recognized as a monetary metal the way gold is. And so you know, our nations don't have, monetary stockpiles of silver and and uh in fact there's there's no large visible stockpiles of silver at all which of course then gets us into another subject we've discussed before which is is the likelihood of a quote-unquote secret stockpile of silver right. so you know the thing is is uh we, we get glimpses of these issues and and, or, and these subjects rather and and so uh we we can Make inferences from from these glimpses, but you know at the same time we, we simply don't have enough concrete data to reach unequivocal conclusions. So, you know, I, I hedge somewhat when when I when I point towards something because you know generally with the amount of information we have available, there there will be two or three possible explanations as as to why we're seeing a particular phenomenon at, at any given moment in time. We're going to see the retail market seize up and it's going to just like it did just like the u.s mint the canadian royal mint the uh, british royal mint all of these massive government mints that produce by far the most um, demanded coins they're the they're the most coveted coins silver coins in the world all three of them either a, ran out, B, went to ration sales, they'll call it allocated, which is just a, a nice way of saying rationed, or B, a com or C, a combination of those two, which is exactly where we're at right now, right? I mean, according to your article, the Royal Canadian Men is still rationing sales. Well, but, but as I've discussed before, uh, the... There's a dichotomy here. Uh, we go to the Eastern Hemisphere, and you know we see India still apparently able to import silver in whatever quantities it wants. And so, you know, over the last couple of years, it's once again been breaking import records, uh, in, breaking the import record that it set previously back in the crash of 08, when when the price of silver plummeted to such a low. And of course, that's another uh, example to to illustrate, we couldn't get silver during the crash of 08. Over in India, they were importing silver in record quantities. So, you know, this this is the whole point here is that, uh, yes, silver is being rationed in the West, but the rationing doesn't necessarily indicate a extremely critical shortage. It simply indicates that they're able to ration silver in the West, and the sheeple here uh, pay so little heed to what that represents that they don't complain about it. The U.S. Mint, of course, is required by statute to keep the U.S. market fully supplied at all times, but it just breaks the law whenever it feels like it and announces it's going to take a two-week holiday on, on sending out any more product, right. and they're able to get away with this. So uh, if we were seeing any sort of constriction of supply in the Eastern world, then I would immediately be saying, yes, you know, uh, some sort of default event is very imminent, but we're not seeing that. At, at least we haven't seen any 
firm indications of that. At, at, at this point in time, it still seems to be an open tap in terms of the flow going to the Eastern world. And it's only in the Western world where the tap gets turned down to just allowing a trickle to flow through. So, uh, you know, this is, this, this is certainly rationing, but it's not necessarily rationing because they're down to their last bar of silver. It could simply be a matter of, well, gee, you know, at this rate, we're only going to be able to keep going for another five more years. So let's tighten the supply in the West. So, you know, this is the whole thing. As long as we continue to see this strange dichotomy where somehow the Eastern world can get as much bullion as it wants and, you know, there's shortages, shortages, shortages in the West, uh, you know, that's still an ambiguous picture. That's going to be a very difficult task to to manage, I would think. I would think that that would be, unless, like you said, you know, the the people in the in the West just they just accept whatever comes down the pike, and it's like, oh well, you know, the man shut down again for eight weeks, you know. Well, that's exactly what happened in the crash of '08. We were just told you can't. There's no silver. There's no silver in the West. In, in, in the East, you know, there's record quantities, uh, you know, flowing onto the shelves and, of course, flowing off the shelves as Indians snap it up. In the West, there's no silver. So, you know, we've, we've been through this once already. And, and uh, of is course, the gonna, point but is... But is that going to stand, a, though, if it happens again? I mean, is there... I, I, I personally believe that the Western retail market has grown substantially since 2008 since that crash has well, happened. It, and I would think that, it, the, it, that it would be a much more vocal uh, outcry or a much more vocal crowd, I should say. Well, it, the, the market uh, ha- it grew immensely right after the crash of wave. We had our, our big rally in the precious metal sector. But, of course, in the Western world where, quote-unquote, investors – are nothing but momentum chasing idiots that look for the highest prices and, and then pile in to that market. Uh, all they had to do to kill Western demand was to, 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 to clamp down on the prices because uh, the idea of, of you know value investing, buying low and selling high, that concept has totally disappeared from the Western world. So, uh, of course, in the East where people are still sane, if you stomp down on the price of gold and silver, they call that a sale and they buy more. And in the West, they stop down on the price of gold and silver, and the, the sheep will say, oh, well, gee, this must mean that nobody uh, wants or likes it, so we're not going to buy it. You know, when we're dealing with that sort of mentality, uh, it becomes much easier to play these games. And, of course, throw in the fact that when the next crash comes, just as in the crash of a way, people will be in a panic and, and not able to think clearly. And, uh, you know, and then, of course, like I say, we, we have been programmed relentlessly to be certs people who simply listen to what we're told and do what we're told so uh, you know this is this is the audience that's going to be receiving these lies when the next crash comes around uh, totally pliant serfs who will, will believe anything and and meekly accept anything they're told uh, you know we we need no more evidence for that than than how we've sat back meekly and allowed our constitutional rights to be taken away from us and all of these fascist laws imposed upon us in our so-called free societies. So, you know, this is the point. The, the, the Western serfs have given no indication at all of, of, uh, of ever finding any backbone to stand up to these fascists. And so as long as that's the case, they're going to continue to inflict their will upon us in whatever manner they choose. Well, I can't argue with that. I mean, unfortunately, it seems like that the uh, you're you're probably a hundred percent right there, uh, Jeff, because the handful that will stand up and and try to make some changes will be squashed immediately, or at least their voice will. I I, I don't know. I, I mean, I still I still hold out hope that you know once the once the stock market crashes, which is being set up for. Uh, I just interviewed David Haggett over at the Great Recession blog, and on December the 16th, 2015, when Janet Yellen raised interest rates, that was the trigger, in his opinion, and I tend to agree that 
that was the trigger that's going to send us into a crash. And it may take, it, it's going to take a little while. And then you combine that with a criminal, uh, Richard Fisher out of the Dallas Fed, you know, saying, yes, we, we did this. We, and, you know, smiling the whole time saying that, yes, we, we set, we set the market up. We front loaded the market. And now there's going to be a quote digestive period where it's going to have to correct however long they manage that down or how they manage it down is where is what we're in for right now. Well, I've actually been even more explicit than that with my own writing. I I didn't call the Fed's rate hike, you know, uh, a little nudge. I called it a torpedo. You know, it's much more than a trigger. It, It was, and of course the reason that the trigger falls short in terms of, of labeling what's happened is simply because of, of the overwhelming evidence that the U.S. economy had already taken a nosedive just before the Fed uh, finally uh, honored its seven-year promise and raised interest rates. And, you know, that sort of timing uh, goes beyond suspicious. It's exactly. conclusive. It is uh, conclusive. You know, so there, there's no doubt about this. And, of course, going back further than that, it was in the fall of, of 2014 that, you know, I, I stated equivocally, you know, next crash in 2016. You know, that's that's the script. Uh, I, I It took me that long to come up with this because I never thought we could make it all the way to 2016. But once we got <laughs> to that point in time, it was very clear. You know, this is this is the script, another eight-year bubble and crash cycle. Uh, you know, do the handoff when the... U.S. election cycle uh, flip flops from one half of the two party dictatorship to the other, and, and you know, start the reset, do it all over again, and that's what they've been doing now over the last 16 years. You know, this is the third bubble and crash cycle that we've had, and uh, third eight year bubble and crash cycle we've had, and it now seems to be their their you know pattern that's carved in stone. So that that's definitely coming, and 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 of course. Default in precious metals markets is definitely coming. The problem is, unlike the crash in the stock market, which we know is coming very soon, we simply don't have any means of pinpointing the default date in precious metals markets. But like I say, it doesn't necessarily have to be a default event. If the bankers simply go too far and torture the market too much, we'll have decoupling, which is the other means of moving towards reality and rationality and justice in these markets. And decoupling is something that the bankers have very little control over, which is one of the reasons I've I've stressed this as a path towards sanity many times over the past three or four years. Decoupling is a very real possibility and perhaps our best hope. So, you know, there's always hope. And and the point is, is that physical markets uh, follow a, a set of principles that are immutable because they're based on arithmetic and so the point is is when you underprice something there will definitely will definitely lead to default and a collapse of the market that's guaranteed what makes gold and silver unique in all the world of of hard assets is that we had these massive stockpiles of these precious metals which have accumulated over 5,000 years of mining and so the fundamentals that apply to all markets simply have a are applying to these markets much more slowly because of the existence of these massive stockpiles. So the fact that we haven't seen a rational fundamental response to the bankers' extreme price suppression does not mean that we're never going to see it. It means it simply means it's even closer than it was because at some point the stockpiles run out and then reality uh, detonates on these markets in one form or another, either through default or via decoupling if they simply push things too hard last question you you've referenced decoupling several times during this conversation what is china and russia what is their role going to be as far as because the price i'm sorry the exchange rate for gold and silver are set in the west gold at the lbma silver at the comax and what is what are they going to have to say when when all of this and it's and it's coming i mean you and i can't say when because i mean i don't know about you but my crystal ball is permanently broken so i don't know when it's going to happen i'm just not a fool and can't see that it is going to happen 
but what are they going to have to say about all of this? Well, that's a great question because, of course, that leads us to another possible uh, avenue of decoupling, which is an official decoupling. Because, of course, as we know, uh, China has announced that it wants to make the Shanghai Gold Exchange a true physical market. Which it is. And, <laughs> well, well, it is and it isn't. Uh, they, 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 they are still trading on a paper basis, but the difference is, is that a lot more metal is taken for delivery in that market. So the, the market still operates roughly according to the same uh, mechanics as the Western paper fraud market. It's just that in the actual transactions themselves, there's a greater degree of legitimacy. But what China's talking about is going further than this and, and essentially transforming this Shanghai Gold Exchange from a paper futures market, which is what it is primarily today, to a true physical market. People simply buying and selling gold, not trading paper certificates that are supposed to represent gold. And, and so this is, is what they're, they're claiming that they're going to be bringing to the Shanghai Gold Exchange. And of course, if they do turn the Shanghai Gold Exchange into a true physical market, almost certainly that implies a, an official decoupling. Because obviously, a, a, a true physical market where all contracts are settled in gold could not possibly operate on the ridiculous paper prices we see in the West, where only you know a, a microscopic percentage of the contracts are ever actually settled in metal. So you know this is definitely another possibility, another possible avenue of decoupling that Russia and China may at some point uh, overtly and directly choose to to make a move in this respect. Yeah, I mean because Russia they 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 have their own market as well. They have, I can't remember if it's the, the Russian gold gold exchange or what. I can't remember its, it's you know, true name, but I do know that it's been operational for well over a year now. And, and they have ramped up the official, their official gold holdings as far as at the state level. But they're, they also have, once again, they have a, a gold market similar to the Shanghai gold, gold exchange. So if the Shanghai Gold Exchange, whenever they finally step up to the plate and say, we're going to start setting a, a, a benchmark price or a benchmark exchange rate, then won't that, at that moment, that will put the West on notice, right? Or how, what, is, what, will, what would be the impact of them doing that right now? Well, of course, the, the question mark is whether what China has pledged is going to become a true reality, because uh, a true physical gold exchange, an internationalized physical gold exchange, would be such a dramatic change from what we have currently that you know it, it's impossible for me to to not uh, look at, at the proposal with a, a little bit of skepticism, uh, you know. So often in the past, we've we've heard rumblings of of changes that that you know we hope would lead to legitimacy, and, and nothing has panned out. So you know, for this reason, I don't want to get uh, overly committed and you know say, oh yeah, we well, you know this is definitely going to solve all of our problems. You know, just wait until such and such a date, and then you know we're going to enter a brave new world. Uh, I, I'm cautiously optimistic. Uh, I certainly fully believe that China and Russia are, are in no way connected to, to the West's crime syndicate system and that they are genuine rivals. And, and, and you know, for that reason, uh, they are definitely motivated to make a break from this system of Western corruption. The question becomes, of course, when will they see the time is right to make these overt moves? Uh, of course, as I've, I've said to you before and, and your audience, uh, you know, for me, when China simply stepped into the open market and started purchasing gold, that was a, a very dramatic moment. Yes. Uh, and, of course, that's why I labeled it, you know, quote, unquote, gold war. So, uh, uh, you know, that could very well have, have been the, the true demarcation point uh, where, you know, Russia and China stopped being merely passive chess players and start to become more active uh, protagonists for us in, in, in the uh global theater and, and if that's the case you know we could see things start, start to change very rapidly and, and in very significant ways it just of course we've all been 
uh, waiting for so long and, and burned with false expectations so often in the past that, you know, I just don't want to be building up people's expectations to too great a level only to see them uh, dashed either partially or completely. Yeah. And, and I respect that. And I, and I appreciate you, you, you saying that Jeff, it just, because we, according to China's own word, we're supposed to, that's already supposed to be in place. It was supposed to have been put into place uh, somewhere around September, October of 2015. Here we are in January, 2016. And it's nothing. There's nothing. And there's no word about when it could possibly be or anything. There hasn't been, there hasn't been word on that for several months now. So like I said, I, I do respect your, what you've just said as far as, you know, not, not wanting to build up false hope, which is, we've, we've had plenty of that. <laughs> and, and the other side of it is that China and Russia themselves, you know, could have a very definitive plan in place, but it's a plan that's based on reacting to particular events. You know, we, we know that there is some major crisis coming. It's going to begin with crashing our markets, but almost certainly there's going to be some other quote unquote big surprise added to it to create additional panic and uncertainty and, and confusion and, and allow the bankers to hide their crimes. Because of course this is the whole reason for creating such panics is is they are even more ripe opportunities for this crime syndicate to engage in their financial raping and pillaging. So you know China and Russia of course, are fully aware that the Western crime syndicate is set, setting us up for another crisis period in the very near future. And it may be that their own big moves are designed already in advance to be responses to that. And so once the, the actual crash is fully detonated and we see these markets start to plummet straight down, that may be the point in time when Russia and China step forward and, and assert much more of a leadership role. And, and you know, so there, there's a lot to be said for that sort of thinking, because if there is a time when we would need other nations to step forward and and show some leadership and present us with a different paradigm option, it's going to be after this next crash, and next crisis is triggered. I continue to hope that that something changes and shifts the uh, paradigm towards the people and away from these criminals because I'm, I'm sick of them. I, I really am. I, I'm, I'm so over it. I can't even begin to tell you. It, it's just, just a blatant criminality. And as, as we've said before, I've, I've say, said to you on, num on numerous uh, occasions, if we can see it, then the people that are running China, that are in charge of Russia, in charge of India, they can see it as well. They can see it a lot clearer than you and I can see it. I mean, and it's just, we, I just, I just really hope that that's something. And I, I may, I may eat these words, but I wish that the system would crash. I wish it would crash today and I wish it would burn. I wish it would burn to the ground because it's not working. And as Chris Dwayne has said uh, for a long time, what's worth saving? What what what's what's worth holding on to? I mean, other than your family and friends. I mean, well, and and sadly, that's uh, the big lesson of history: is we rarely move out of a period of of devolution and corruption uh, directly towards you know some path. Toward, uh, of growth and, and prosperity. It's almost always uh, a complete crash of the old system, reduced to complete rubble, and then something new and better rises out of the rubble. And the problem being is that until the system of corruption is reduced to rubble, the levers of control aren't shattered, and thus the possibility of something better emerging is very slim. And so, you know, that's of course why we you know, hear people such as yourself, you know, moderate, uh, you know, rational people, to, you know, saying, you know, let's, let's see the system crash because the only thing that's going to shatter the levers of control is to reduce the system to rubble. And, uh, you know, I, I continue to hold out hope that in the 21st century, 
we might have reached a greater level of sophistication that we can actually move from corruption to legitimacy without going all the way to rubble. But of course, it's slim hope. You know, so so we do what we do, trying to create the critical mass of awareness, hoping to avoid the collapse to rubble. We fear, of course, that that's inevitable. And, you know, that's the way we have to proceed. So, you yes. know, that's that's the world we have. And there's no point in uh, sugarcoating it or pretending it doesn't exist. We simply have to deal with the realities, protect ourselves as individuals and, of course, unite as people. Divide and conquer uh, is the banker's motto. United we stand, divided we fall. Exactly. Well, and that is that's a that's a great uh, ending point right there, Jeff. United we stand, divided we fall. We've got to take care of one another, and we've got to take care of our family, and get prepared. I mean, it's it's what's happening right now. If you don't see the cracks in the in the system, if you don't see them that are expanding on a daily basis, then you need to open your eyes a little further because they're very, very clear, in my opinion. They're clear for all to see. So we've been speaking with uh, Jeff Nielsen from Bullion Bulls Canada. Jeff, tell everybody how they can get a hold of you. Well, of course, my own site, bullionbullscanada.com, has been around for about seven years now, and I publish more than 1,100 commentaries, and we also have a, a very large and active community and forum so people are welcome to come to the site and sign up it's a free site as you've also mentioned i have a i'm a contributing writer to sprout money and i regularly send them my commentaries as well which they publish and they're also spread around at uh places of course like the daily coin and stt report and zero hedge and of course other sites pick me up as well so people can see my work at various places but naturally i would prefer they come to my site and see it directly from the source <laughs> go to the source you, you do have a you have a great uh forum there with uh, that's very active and and it's it's pretty awesome it's very a lot a lot of really good people hanging out there so go join them and jeff i certainly appreciate all your time and uh i look forward to speaking with you in the, in the not too distant future it's always great to chat, and I'll be happy to come back anytime. All right. Thank you so much. Take care.